Please turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 3 as we continue this week our study in the uh, book of Titus, continuing in particular the instruction that Paul has given Titus, the things he should teach in the third chapter uh, about good works and about salvation and how the two relate to one another. The first part of the chapter, he is told that Titus things he should remind God's people of. He should remind us of, to be uh, basically to be involved in good works, respectful to authorities and not to speak evil of others and so on. And then he reminds us that we once were sinful people. So that as we try to help other people to live right, we need to remember the fact that we also have been wrong in our lives and we needed forgiveness of our sins. We needed them to be reminded to live good lives. And we'll see as we proceed this evening that we need to uh, be reminded about what our, what our Savior has done for us to solve the problems of our sin. So we were through verse 3 then last time. Questions or discussion anybody has through verse 3 before we begin class this evening? All right, let's read verses 4 through 7. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Who would like to read that for us, please? Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Bill, would you read that for us, please? Between the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appears, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay. So verse 3, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, involved in various lusts, and so forth. And now he says, according to his mercy, I had the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. So by the mercy of God, we have received kindness and love uh, from God. Now we'll notice the things that are involved in that as we go through. And we want to notice not only what mistakes some folks have made in some of these ideas that we're going to be discussing to make sure that we uh, understand the truth, but also to appreciate what God has done for us to make our salvation possible because we were foolish and disobedient and so on. So the kindness and love of God toward man appeared. Now we talked in chapter 2 and uh, verses 11 through 14 especially about the grace and mercy of God and how that uh, was made available through Christ and taught us again that we should live by uh, good works. But in particular, what did God do to make possible uh, our forgiveness? What did God do with God our Savior? When his kindness appeared, what in particular did he do? Back in chapter 2. What had God done by his grace? In chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. He brought salvation to us. He brought salvation? And he brought salvation, in particular, it says, through Jesus Christ. Okay? So the salvation was made, we've discussed that. But now what the, that kindness appeared to us. Now we're going to see something about our responsibility in, involved in this. And first of all, he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Now we need to understand that. And I have several questions about it. Uh, <clears throat> and refer you back to chapter 2 and then some other questions that I want to really questions number 16. <clears throat> and it'll take us clear down, I suppose, through other verse 20, question number 23. All those questions go together. But to begin with, he says, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us. So let's discuss the idea that it's not of works of righteousness which we have done. So I ask a question number 17. What a person have to do to save himself by his own works of righteousness? How could, how could a person save himself by his own works of righteousness? He says it's not that way, but what would that way be? If a person could do it, what would that involve? What would that person have to do? Well, I have to live perfectly, okay? 
Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10 with me, please. Galatians chapter 3. And there are a number of verses that discuss it. And we've discussed it a good bit in the Sunday morning adult class in the book of, of uh, Romans. But this verse in Galatians 3 and verse 10 helps me to understand what it means when it talks about uh, works of the law and the kind of works it would take and what happens if we live under that kind of law. I'd like to read Galatians 3 and verse 10 for us, please. Galatians 3 and verse 10, you'd like to read that for us, please. Steve. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Okay. All right, so now in verse 10, he's talking about the works of the law and the problem involved in trying to justify ourselves by the works of the law. How many things do we have to do according to the law in verse 10? How many other things do we have to do? All of them. What happens according to that law if we, are, if we don't do all of them? If we mess up anywhere, what happens? What's the verse say? Rick? The law. You broke the law. We've broken the law. What are you going to say, Rick? So you're cursed. We're under a curse. Okay. Now, he's talking here about the works of the law, and he quoted a passage from the Old Testament. Now, when the books of the New Testament talk about the works of the law, Basically, it's talking about the Old Testament law. Now, I realize that the same principles would apply to any other law that's like the Old Testament law, but in our Sunday morning class in Romans and here in Galatians, uh, when it talks about works of the law and why we can't be justified by the law and the works of the law, it's talking about a law like the Old Testament. So, what was wrong, or not to say wrong, what was missing? in that law whereby it couldn't justify us. The passage says we would have to continue in all things written in the law or we'd be cursed. What was missing in the law to solve that problem? Rick? Perfect sacrifice. Okay. So Hebrews chapter 10, the first four verses thereabouts show that under that law that though we'd offer an animal, sacri animal sacrifice, the sins would be remembered again. So the problem with a law of works, which required works of law, which is what he's talking about here in Titus chapter two, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, in order to be justified that way, you have to live your whole life and never do anything wrong. Never violate because you have to abide by all things or you're under a curse. And if you sin, which the Bible says we all do, and we know we all do, then that law couldn't solve the problem. Kill an animal wouldn't solve the problem. So did not have a sacrifice that would solve the problem. So that's what's being discussed when it talks about works of righteousness, which we have done. It's discussing uh, a, a system under which here's right, here's wrong. You have to do the right, you have to do wrong. But if you have to avoid the wrong, but if you, do, if you don't obey properly, then you're under a curse, and there's nothing the law can do to get rid of that permanently. Karen, what were you going to say? Um, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble at one point is guilty of all. Okay. Anybody else have another passage or another comment on the problem of... And as in question number 17, the problem of trying to be righteous based on what we have done. If you don't have mercy, if you don't have grace, if you don't have the sacrifice of Christ, what's, uh, what a problem does that create? Anybody have any other scriptures you want to talk about or other comments on the problem that that creates? Bill. Uh, Romans 3, verse 20. Uh, Paul Therefore, by the deeds of his law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. 
for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, thank you, Bill. See, that's saying the same thing. You, we're not going to be justified by the deeds of the law. A law like the Old Testament law. That doesn't mean that there's no law involved in our salvation. There is law in our salvation. The New Testament is a law. But the thing is, the New Testament also has sacrifice. It also has forgiveness. So it's not saying that law is irrelevant or even bad, or that we're not saved by law in any sense, but that kind of law. Why, why was it that Paul so often talked about the law, and people couldn't be saved by the law? Why was it, if you think back of your New Testament history and the overall view of the New Testament, why is it that Paul is bringing that up again and again, Romans and Galatians and, and Ephesians and Colossians and Hebrews, over and over again that comes up, why? Debbie. Because he's talking to the Jews and they believe that the law would save them. Okay. The situation, you look at Acts chapter 15, you see maybe one of the first places where it's discussed, there were those, even those who had been from a Jewish background who were attached to that old law with its service and so on, this, especially the circumcision. And that was the sign that they were especially God's people under the Old Testament. But the New Testament teaches now that that law is no longer in effect. And now we're, second, we're justified to, well, by a system that does have forgiveness of sins that does have a sacrifice of their gifts, and that's the gospel. But even when those people became uh, uh, followers of Christ, professed to be followers of the gospel, they kept bringing it back in. You've got to be circumcised, or you can, even the Gentiles have to be circumcised, or you can't be saved. Again and again and again, Paul ran into that problem with it, and that's why you see it again and again and again in the New Testament. People were trying to bind that old law. And that's what Paul is talking about when he talks about you can't be saved that way. Debbie, you have another comment? Well, I think that's the same problem people in denominations have today. They like the way their church is made. They like the way they have salvation. They don't want to hear anything different. Okay. But in particular, what Paul is showing is the old law, that was not, it wasn't a bad law. It showed people right from wrong. And it taught them, as Romans chapter 3 has said, uh, Romans 3, chapter 3, verse 20, as Bill read, uh, it showed people when they were wrong, but it couldn't solve the problem. So what you have is, we cannot be saved by works of righteousness which we have done. What we need then back in Titus chapter 3 is the kindness and the love of God our Savior according to his mercy to save us. And we're going to see what's involved in that, but again the last part of verse 6, uh, through Jesus Christ our Savior. That's what we've got now. It didn't have under the law. And that's why he keeps talking about the law. Not because law is bad, but because if all you have is do this and don't do that, you're not going to be saved because we all have failed. We need the gospel, which still says do this and don't do that, but also has a way to be forgiven when we fail. Grace. Okay? Other comments? Did I see another hand? Frank. <clears throat> Uh, in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, said, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the peoples shall say amen. And that's taught again and again in the Old Testament, isn't it? And the New Testament also tells us that we're, under, uh, that we're displeasing to God when we disobey. It's not that... It's, it's not that See, people make a mistake and say, well, then it doesn't matter whether we obey. We can be saved even when you don't obey. You don't have to do good works. That isn't the point. The point is there's a forgiveness when we fail. That's what the point that he's making, and we'll emphasize that more as we go along. But we need to understand that we are not going to earn salvation by a sinless life. It's too late because we've all sinned. Okay? Other comments on not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Can I ask you some other questions about that will bring this out more fully? <clears throat> Let me see what we've got here. All right. Question number 18. What we need, one thing we need to understand is that there are different kinds of works. You know, so when the Bible said we're not saved by works, people say, well, okay, do I have to do anything then? Faith only. Do I have to do, obey any laws? Do I have to, there's nothing to do. Baptism is irrelevant. Anything you do is, is irrelevant. Uh, 
because you're not of works. You need to understand there are different kinds of works, like there's different kinds of law, and different kinds of faith, and different kinds of love, and so on. There are different kinds of works. So what are some of those works? So question number 13, what are some kind of works that are mentioned in scripture? Different kinds and maybe some scriptures to talk about them. What are some different kinds of works that you find in scripture? Question number 18. What's one kind? Right, uh, Frank. The sacrifices, uh, the animal sacrifices. Okay. Okay, that would be one kind. And we already learned in Hebrews 10 that that really wouldn't forgive sins, would it? Now, that's a work. It's something you do according to the law, but it wouldn't save because the sin could be remembered. Other passages or other examples? Karen. Um, John 6, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So, according to the Bible, belief is a work. All right. Now, see that two different kinds of works. Animal sacrifices, that's a work, but it's not going to save us. Under the law, they were required to do it, but it wouldn't save because it couldn't forgive sins. But now, under the gospel, faith is also a work. It's something you do. It may not be an outward observable work, but it's something that you do. You either do it or you don't, and you have a choice. But if you do it, then you can be saved. So here's a work that is essential to salvation. And anybody who believes in the New Testament knows you have to be believed to be saved. So there's a work that is necessary to salvation, but it's something you have to do. Okay? Other examples of works. Uh, Steve. In James 2 and 25, Jesus said, Whoever does not already have the harvest, also justified by works. And she received the messengers and sent them out another way. Okay. And you read the whole context. Chapter 2 of James, verse 14 through verse 26. And he says we are justified by works and not by faith only. And the, uh, faith without works is dead. So faith was a work, John 6 said, necessary to salvation, but it doesn't earn your salvation. But you still have to do it. But also, that faith must lead to obedience. So that kind of obedience is essential to be saved. It doesn't earn your salvation. You can't earn it because you've sinned. And now the only way to be saved that way would be to never sin. We've already sinned, so you can't be saved that way. What we need is forgiveness. But in order to be forgiven, we need faith. But it's a faith that leads us to obey. That leads us to realize, I've been wrong. I'm going to change and do right. All right anybody have any other examples of works that help us understand the different kinds of works? Sure. Psalm 40 and verse 5 says, Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works. So, in this verse, works just means mighty deeds that God does. Okay, so different kinds of works. So let me illustrate then on the chart some different kinds of works, categories, groups of works. First of all, there's works of the flesh. Galatians 5, which are sinful works. Well, obviously those don't save, but that's a kind of work. It doesn't save. We've been talking now, specifically then, about works of the law. That is, works of human righteousness, where the only way to be saved, according to the scriptures we've read, is to do everything right and never do anything wrong. We will not be saved that way. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do right, but it's not going to save us because we've all done wrong. So that kind of work is not bad. Uh, if it was the Old Testament law, of course, that's been done away. But even under the New Testament, there are laws of do this and don't do that. That's good. It's necessary. But the only way to be saved just by the, by your own human righteousness, Titus 3, would do it all your life long and never do anything wrong, which none of us do. So it's not going to save. doesn't mean it's wrong to do what's good, but it won't save you because we've all done wrong. Uh, uh, Bill. Uh, in, uh John 3, verse 3, says, most, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, we're going to come back to that context in just a few minutes when we get to the washing of regeneration. Because that's what will save us, he says. Not by works of righteousness we've done, but by his mercy through the washing of regeneration. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But there's another kind of works in the, in the gospel. 
And that is those things that we do to receive forgiveness, according to the Word of God. Uh, it's, this is based on a system like the New Testament that has a sacrifice that we believe in, a system of faith. Faith in a sacrifice that really can forgive sins. It doesn't earn your forgiveness. But you still have to meet the conditions. You still have to believe. And we'll see you still have to have the washing of regeneration. The faith needs to learn to these good works he talked about in verse chapter 3 and verse 1. And he's talking about again and again throughout the book of Titus. Repeatedly he's telling us that we need good works. We can't be saved without good works. But you can't earn your salvation that way because you need forgiveness. In it. Do good, but understand you need sac the sacrifice of Jesus to forgive you when you fail and to receive that benefit of that sacrifice, you have to meet conditions. You have to do what he tells you to do. So you see different kinds of works. Some are bad. Some are okay, but won't save you. Others are necessary to receive the forgiveness that God offers. Okay? So you've got some kinds of works that are essential to salvation and others that are not. So when you read a passage like Titus chapter 3, we're not by works of righteousness, which we have done, understand the different kinds of works being mentioned in Scripture. Don't make the mistake that some people do and say, okay, then there's nothing to do. Well, you can't earn it, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to be done. Other comments on the uh, not by works of righteousness. All right, so I also ask you uh, question number uh, let's see. Question number 22. Nope. Nope, never mind. All right, I'll just go ahead and do it. I don't know. I had a question on it. But anyway, here's some passages to talk about obedience that's necessary to salvation. Many verses that talk about it. We know that. We've studied our Bibles together enough. In particular, uh, if there was nothing to do to be saved, you wouldn't have to believe because we've already learned that believing is something you do. You wouldn't have to love. But love is something to do, but it's the greatest command. You wouldn't have to repent because that's something that you do. And yet we know that we must repent in order to be saved. So uh, all of these things are necessary. They are commandments, but they don't earn salvation. So they're not eliminated when it says we're not of works. And the same thing is true of baptism. When you understand the principle, then you understand why over and over again, if you talk with your friends about salvation and they come to faith only and they say you don't have to be baptized to be saved, that's the mistake they're making. They're thinking that it's earning your salvation or that uh, you're just by faith and it's not by works. They're making a mistake about the different kinds of works and what the Bible says about them. And I thought I saw a hand or two. I see the hands. Any comments you want to make? All right. Okay. I also ask you about this concept of not by, or excuse me, not but. Verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now several times we have talked together about the, these not but expressions, and Darrell talked about it a good bit not long ago in one of his sermons. Here we have one of them. Not by this, but according to that. Okay, so I ask you question number 19. I even gave you this a bunch of, this is common in the, in the New Testament. I gave you a bunch of examples. What is the significance when you have one of these not but situations? What is the thing to understand about the proper application of a so called not but expression? Question number 19. Someone want to explain it for us? Frank. They're not excluded, but they do have an important role to play. Okay. So when you have a one of these not but expression, it isn't denying that the first thing is is there. It may, it may even be important. It's simply trying to emphasize the second point. It isn't saying the first one is wrong or bad. Uh, it may even be as important, but it's just that the second thing is more important. It's emphasizing the second one. Okay. So I gave you a whole list of examples in the scriptures there. Uh, and and Daryl again talked about some of them with us. Uh, anybody want to talk about any of those past examples in particular? 
Rick. Just verse 4 there leads into that. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works, but according to His mercy, this was all God's will. You can't do anything to earn that will. God gives that will to you. Okay. Oh, Karen, are you going to? Okay. But so, that's not, that doesn't mean that there's nothing to do. So you say, well, there's nothing to do. No. Which is not by works of righteousness. That doesn't mean there's nothing to do. He's emphasizing the second point. Well, let's look at a couple of examples of them. In fact, there's one in particular I just like for us to notice. Look at John 12, verse 44. In the notes, I gave you a whole list of these. But I want to emphasize just one or two, and then we'll move on. John 12, verse 44. Who would like to read this for us, please? John 12, verse 44. Who would like to read that for us, please? Neil, please. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. Okay. There's a not but. He who believes in me does not believe in me. But in him who sent me. So when he says he does not believe in me, is he saying he doesn't you don't believe in me? Of course not. He just got through saying you do believe in me. But the, what he's emphasizing is the but part. But in him who sent me. In other words, Jesus wasn't coming on his own will, doing what he, uh, by himself, without authority from the Father. So it's a not but. He believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. He's simply emphasizing the second point. He's not denying that you believe in him or that you must believe, must believe in him. He's emphasizing the second point, that he's sent by his Father. Okay? That's all we mean by these not but expressions. Okay? And there's a lot more in the, in the notes there. Oh, let's look at one more. Here's, another, here's a point where it's really helpful. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's an example of this. Uh, also important in discussion about baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 17. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. you would like to read that one for us, please? First Corinthians 1, verse 17. Bill, please. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not the wisdom of words, but to preach the cross, that Christ should be made in the world of faith. All right, so Paul said, Christ did not send me to be to baptize. So people say, see, see there, baptism is not important. Paul wasn't sent to baptize. Baptism is not important. That'd be, Paul said he was glad he had verses above his body. He didn't baptize any more of them than he did. So baptism is not important. Is that what he's saying? No. He says Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. When Paul preached the gospel, did he have to baptize all those people who were accepted the gospel? Did he have to do it personally? Dip him in the water, dip him in the water, dip him in the water. It didn't matter who baptized him. That wasn't, in any particular way, Paul's job. His job was to preach the gospel. That's what, he, he's simply emphasizing that in the verse. And that's why he said in the verses above it, he didn't, God, he hadn't baptized anybody but uh, Crispus and Gaius and the household of Stephanus, lest people said I baptized in my own name. Not that baptism isn't, isn't necessary. He's simply saying it wasn't particularly my job to do it. My job was to teach the people. When they needed to be baptized, anybody could do it. But it wasn't in particular. So that's a not but, you see. Not that the first thing, he, he already just got there saying you baptized some of them. But that wasn't what he emphasized. Now here in Titus chapter 3, we have an example of it. He's not saying that, there are, that we need to do things to be righteous. He's not denying that. He's not denying that. He's emphasizing the second point. That we're saved through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. All right. Other comments before we get into the washing and regeneration? Other discussion? Anybody? All right. So let's look at the washing and regeneration. Question number 21. What is regeneration? What does it mean, regeneration? What's the meaning of it? Karen? Uh, a new birth. All right, it's being born again, regenerated, born again, a new birth. All right. So I ask you for some other questions, passages about the new birth. What are some other gospel passages that talk about being born again or being 
of the new birth. Anybody else have other passages about being born again? Okay. Uh, John 3, 3 and 5, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. All right, that's the verse that Bill read earlier. But notice he says that we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless we are born again, regenerated, born again, born of the water and the spirit. Remember that part, we're going to come back to it in just a few minutes, but it must be born again, regenerated. Okay? Any other scriptures about being born again, Terry? Um, 1 Peter 1, verse 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. All right, now that verse is, ties into our study here as well. Because he said we're born again by his abundant mercy. There's the grace, you see. Born again to a living hope unto an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled. Well, the inheritance is there in Titus chapter 3 and verse 7 too. So we come back to Titus 3. We're going to talk about the inheritance some more. As well as the being born again, being regenerated by the mercy of God. But while you're there in 1 Peter chapter 1, also look down at verse 22 of chapter 1, uh, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, and since you love with the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So there's the rebirth, but notice you purify your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. We're going to talk about the Spirit in just a few minutes, and we're going to see the connection to the truth. But there's another passage about being born again. But notice, you're not born again without doing anything. You have to obey the truth. Okay? So when it's said not by works of righteousness, it's not saying there's nothing to do. It's just saying that the things you do don't earn your salvation because you still need forgiveness of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now there's lots of other passages about being born again, and we'll talk about some more even as we go along. But notice he says... Back in Titus chapter 3. Uh, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we've got to be regenerated, born again, but what is the washing of regeneration? What New Testament command or in, in act, practice requires a washing? What is that? Baptism. Baptism is the washing. Okay. Uh, what do you have? Some scriptures that show that washing, a baptism involves a washing or a cleansing. Or another passage that ties baptism, question number 22 and 23, that ties baptism to being born again. Another passage that talks about baptism cleansing or baptism in connection with being born again. But have some scripture for us at Velma. In 1 Peter 3.21, the life figure will unto baptism doth also not save us, not putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so baptism saves us, okay? Not just washing away the filth of the flesh, but it's a response of our service to God, but it still involves a washing in water. Other p passages, other comments. Karen. Uh, Acts 22, 16, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Call on the name of the Lord. All right, so in, in baptism, you wash away your sins. Not by the water, 1 Peter 3, 21, not the power, the power is in the water, it's in the blood of Jesus. But you have to do what he says. It's conditional. It's not unconditional. You meet the condition, his blood forgives you. You can't be saved without the blood. 
but it's in baptism that the blood washes away the sins. So, and so then you're born again. It's the washing of regeneration. Okay? Other passages, other comments? Steve. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, it talks about the washing of the blood. Yeah. Well, since for some of you, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay. Interesting, that ties in the Spirit, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute. Okay, any others? Okay. Um, I think it's interesting in Romans 6, 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, but just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Holy Spirit, so we also should walk in newness of life. So this connects baptism with this regeneration, this new birth, this new life that we rise to. Okay, so when we're baptized then, you see, our sins are forgiven, we rise to walk in a new life. We are born again. We are regenerated. It is the washing of regeneration. Okay? But uh, time is getting short, so let's tie in the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit have to do with all this? Okay, what's the connection of the Holy Spirit? And question number 20, uh, 25 and 26, what's the role of the Holy Spirit in this washing of regeneration? What's the Holy Spirit have to do with it? Right. Uh, Holy Spirit revealed the gospel, plan of salvation. Okay. How do we know what to do to receive the forgiveness, the cleansing, the washing, the regeneration? How do you know that? Through the teaching of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has revealed the message whereby we can be renewed. When we learn the message of the gospel, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the gospel revealed by the Spirit. When we do that, when we do these, all these other passages say, we're baptized, we walk in newness of life. John chapter 3, then, you can't enter the kingdom unless you're born again by the water, baptism, and the Spirit, the teaching of the gospel. The gospel teaches you that you need to be baptized. When by faith you obey, then you're washed, you're regenerated, and you have the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And that then leads, then, the passage says, uh, to uh, being heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I know the comments or discussion anybody has on verse 5 specifically, the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Karen. Uh, John 6, 63 says it is the Spirit who gives life. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They're All right, the words that I speak are spirit and are life. Now what that means then is baptism is not a work of human righteousness. That is to say, when he says you're not, you're justified not by works of righteousness which we have done, he's not eliminating baptism at all. Baptism, in fact, is in the verse. That's something required. It's the washing of regeneration. So don't, don't become confused by verses like this, and if you're talking to somebody who is confused, help them to understand the different kinds of works, that the salvation is conditional, involves the blood of Christ, verse Six, but it also requires obedience, including the washing of regeneration. Anything else before we close then this evening? All right, we'll take up then in verse uh, six. We'll talk a little bit more about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and on down through the rest of the chapter then next week, Lord willing. Thank you.